<laughs> so it's with great pleasure to, uh, that I can introduce you to Johannes Harbold, who um, is a lecturer here, in, a senior lecturer mm -hmm. uh, in Durham, and one of the people who really helped me when I was doing my PhD in Cambridge. So um, it's, it's really a privilege to, to be here uh, with him today. And Johannes, you were giving a, giving a paper yesterday? Uh, yes, that's right, yes. And what was the subject? Uh, it was on Greek and Mesopotamian fables. Right. But, uh, tracing some of the connections between them and thinking about how we might read those connections. Um, so what kind of evidence are, you, are we using here when you, when you, when you say fables, what, mm -hmm. what do we mean? Mm -hmm. Well, um, we have several uh, collections of ancient Mesopotamian fables, some of them written in Sumerian, some mm -hmm. of them written in Akkadian. Um, in date they range from approximately 2000 BCE to 700 BCE. Um, and on the Greek side we have prose collections of Greek fables that go under the name of Aesop. Uh, these survive in medieval manuscript. Mm -hmm. uh, and we also then have um, verse uh, collections. Um, Babrius uh, in the um, first or second century CE, so um, uh, quite a bit later than the Mesopotamian tales, uh, he uh, made a collection of Aesopic fables in, um, in verse. Um, he became very popular and uh, many people imitated him, recycled his material, um, and then we also find um, uh, scattered fables in the poetry of people like Mesomedes, who was a rough contemporary of Babrius. Mm -hmm. so. And you're saying that you're looking at the connections between um, Greek and Mesop Mesopotamian fable. I mean, how are you yes. going about that? Yes. Well, I mean, it, 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 it's been pointed out that some of the extant uh, Greek fables bear a striking resemblance with some Mesopotamian fables. There is one in particular that has often been singled out for comparison, which is the fable of the elephant and the mosquito, or the bull and the mosquito. How does it go? Um, well, uh, as told by Babrius, it goes like this. Uh, a mosquito settles on the horn of a bull and uh, politely uh, inquires whether it's making a nuisance of itself and uh, uh, promises to be off uh, presently. Uh, the bull scornfully uh, retorts that it hadn't noticed the, uh, <laughs> that the mosquito had arrived and, and couldn't care less when it leaves. <laughs> so it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a fable about uh, um, self-importance, you know, self mm -hmm. uh, misguided self-importance, about, um, yeah. And we see this in both the Mesopotamian and also in the Greek source. Yes. Now, uh, uh, um, the corresponding uh, Mesopotamian fable, if you like, uh, in Akkadian, in this particular case, the Semitic language of ancient Babylon, uh, uh, tells the story of a uh, little animal, uh, a, a little bird, as it happens, not not um, uh, not a mosquito in that case, um, settling on an elephant. And again, politely asking whether it's uh, being a burden, and and you can imagine the rest. The elephant <laughs> uh, snorts that it hadn't uh, noticed uh, when the bird settled and wouldn't care whether it left. So uh, there are really very striking similarities yeah. between these texts, and the question arises what we make of them. And what do you make of them? Well, um... Um, previous scholars have um, tended to treat the, um, the Mesopotamian fable as a source mm -hmm. for the, for mm -hmm. the uh, Greek, uh, later Greek versions, um, probably with an uh, Aramaic intermediary. Um, and that may well be how the fable, uh, in fact, spread from Mesopotamia to So kind of Greece. a direct connection. Uh, yes. Kind of this a genealogy, yeah, a, a yeah. sort of, yes, uh, uh, um, of literary transmission. It's how people talk about the Homeric, uh, certain, well, certain, um, certain themes in the Homeric poems, and especially Hesiod, you know, the yes. cosmology. Yes, you're right. Um, now, this, um, this approach 
has um, uh, you know is attractive in in the sense that it can um, suggest uh, non-Western sources, as mm-hmm. it were, mm-hmm. to uh, Greek literature, um, you know, and that uh, then feeds into uh, broader discussions about um, uh, Greece as the cradle of Western right. civilization and right. so on. Uh, and one can, you know, one can see why would one go down, what might want to go down that route. Everything gets shifted further east. Exactly. Yeah, 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 yes. Yeah. So you go further. You go yeah. further east as you go further back. Yeah. 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 yeah, 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 yeah. But um, there are, of course, pitfalls. Yeah. Um, there are problems with this kind of approach. And one problem is that, understandably, scholars are keen to. Um, see as many similarities as possible mm-hmm. between these mm-hmm. texts, mm-hmm. so you know, so as to make the narrative of tran- uh, transmission that much more striking. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and um, in my paper, I um, uh, sort of reviewed uh, past scholarship uh, uh, on this, and I, and I, and I showed that um, not only was the Akkadian source misunderstood mm-hmm. because... Uh, people tended to infer its meaning from the Greek sources. So they, for example, uh, they thought there was a mis- mosquito, there had to be right. in the Akkadian text. Right. So uh, not only was the, the Mesopotamian fable misunderstood, but also uh, the Greek uh, 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 fables were uh, being read in, in a way, you know, which made them seem rather uninteresting mm-hmm. as texts. You know, mere survivals. Um, um, Everything is just taken relics. from this original source. Yes. Yeah. 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 So how do you account for it? Well, um, I think there has got to be a connection. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's important and exciting. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think it is also important that as classicists and the scholars of the ancient world, we uh, pay proper attention to the texts in their own context, and that we don't allow sort of ideologically charged debates about the origins of Greek literature, Western culture, to, to, to you know, obscure our understanding of these texts. Um, my um, uh, test case, my example, mm-hmm. was Mesomedes and his... Uh, uh, take on this fable. Mesomedes does something very cunning. He, um, uh, you know, tells the story uh, uh, the usual way. Uh, um, this is still the mosquito. This is still the, okay. mo- this is still the mosquito. Um, except that he has a mosquito and an elephant, mm-hmm. and the mosquito settles, uh, n- uh, of course, not on the horns of the elephant, which, uh, which he doesn't have, but on his ear. Right. Now, would be, again, very tempting to say, ah, wonderful, here we have uh, the Assyrian elephant, (laughs) still extant, as it were, a living fossil of the literary (laughs) tradition, yeah? It's like those mammoths that survived somewhere in Siberia down to 2000 BC, very suggestive. Um, But, of course, we we have to ask, why does uh, Mesomedes opt for the elephant in a context where the bull was already available, and not only that, where the bull was in fact the default option, as we might call it. Yeah. And uh, there, one can see something very interesting happening, because that, um, um, that combination of elephant, mosquito, and mosquito settling on the ear of the elephant takes on really quite a different meaning, potentially, from the original, you know, from by, um, the fable of bull and sure, mosquito. something's happening here with the ear. Something's happening. Right. Something very important. Something here with the ear, and we can tell because Achilles Tatius, at around the same time, uh, still second century AD, um, tells a fable of an uh, elephant uh, to- uh, uh, talking to a lion. The lion asks the elephant, "What are you doing with your ear? Why do you keep wiggling your ear?" Why? Uh, and the elephant says, see that tiny little uh, creature there, pointing to a mosquito, flying a buzzing, buzzing bird? If that were to get into my ear, it would be the death of me. It would be, it would be the oh, end of me. Oh, interesting. It would be the end of me. Now, um, that all has its own context in yes. Achilles' stations, of course, yes. but it, it rather suggests that Mesomedes' choice of uh, 
elephant mosquito, mosquito settling on the ear of an elephant takes on a really quite, uh, you know, interesting... It has a, it has a meaning outside any uh, idea that the, the, uh, there's a return to the elephant as the source. Yes, yes. Well, this, 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 you know, this takes us straight into a, into a context where people were thinking very hard about patronage. Yes. About power relationships right. at the, at the having imperial the ear, court, having the ear of the emperor. Having the emperor. well, having the ear of the emperor exactly. Yeah. Uh, um, Mesomedes was a freedman of Hadrian. He was very close to Hadrian, um, and Tim Whitmarsh has, has uh, discussed this uh, very interestingly. He has pointed out various other parallels within a second sophistic context, second sophistic, the sort of broader cultural uh, context of the of the second century um, CE. So. Um, then, of course, the question arises, where does that leave us with our Assyrian right. parallel? Right. Um, do we need that? Do we, do we even want it, yeah. um, apart from simply noting yeah. the fact? Does it help in any does way? Does it help? So, yeah, yes. Um, so my, my suggestion was um, that, yes, it can help. Uh, and it can help to... Um, it can help because it, it you know it it broadens the range of texts on which we can draw for inspiration mm -hmm. um, because it turns out there is also uh, another um, a Syrian fable, another Mesopotamian fable um, which uh, corresponds with um, our elephant and uh, and little uh, animal elephant and mosquito, uh, but which again subverts it right. So, all of a sudden, you get the sense not of a sort of one-dimensional uh, stem of transmission, mm -hmm. but of a, of a literary field in which, at any given time, mm -hmm. um, intelligent, clever uh, storytellers were doing intelligent, clever things. Yeah. That cuts across cultures, yeah. and all of a sudden we have a scenario where we are indeed moving uh, quite freely uh, across the ancient world, where we are no longer... Uh, 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 simply, uh, as it were, fixing on ancient Greece. Yes. Um, or, or further east. So, or indeed yeah. further east. Is exactly. you, what we're seeing here is actually a network of yeah. connections, or of storytelling, of particular yeah. ways of, um, of, yeah. well, of telling the story yeah. and, and communicating to an audience. Yeah. Across languages, yeah. across cultures. Um, and now, in the in the particular case of the fable, it makes very good sense, in my view, to look at all those materials. Mm. Because, um, even from a strictly Greek perspective, uh, what we now call the Greek fable was not actually um, thought of as a specifically Greek achievement. Uh, Aesop uh, was thought to be a non-Greek. Right, an outsider. A an outsider. Right. A Thracian, a, a, right. you know, a Lydian. So even if he's represented in the Greek tradition, he's seen as an other. Yes. And, exactly. and bring this yeah. in. Yeah. 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 Doing something different from what Greeks yeah. do, in a way. Yes. Epic. You know, yes. Like, yes. Yeah. And uh, so that was, one, that was one way of looking at it. But, uh, but um, there is also, um, so, so, you know, the fable as, as, as something that can challenge um, high culture that yeah. comes in at an angle, yeah, yeah, comes yeah, in yeah. from the outside. Yeah. Um, but, um, but fable could also be looked at as something that was, uh, as it were, um, um, pre-cultural or subcultural or, um, you know, a, a sort of a shared, um, a, a shared wisdom uh, which uh, is not culturally specific. So if you read any given fable, mm. what you get is, you know, animals, right. types of people. Right. What you don't get is a strong sense that cultural difference matters. Yeah. I see. So this is something that gets edited out. Yeah. Um, and, um, uh, and, and it finds reflection... Uh, you know, it is reflected in these in, 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 in these genealogies of the fable as you know coming uh, from elsewhere, spreading into Greece. And, I see. And, uh, yeah, because it doesn't have anything specific within it to tie it to a particular location or time. Exactly. Yeah. It's not about uh, you know terribly well educated Greek people discussing yeah. terribly uh, you know uh, 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 Greek concerns. Um, it is actually universal in scope. Right. And so it seems appropriate, again, 
that we should study this genre right. um, cross-culturally. Right, there's so much freedom for the reader here to interpret what's going on. Yes. I see. Yes, yes, yes. You get something which is sort of, um, you know, universally human. Yeah. Um, a logos that human beings tell. That's how Achillochus in one of the earliest right. Um, right. Uh, you know, tellings of a Greek fable uh, uh, introduces it. This is, this is, you know, this is something that human beings say and then comes the fable. Uh, using the animal kingdom actually to yes. understand ourselves. Exactly, to set, to set us off uh, as well ontologically rather than culturally. So, right. so the, and, um, uh, and so um, uh, I take that as you know again as inspiration right. for uh, for ranging across. Because uh, then you can start looking at how the fable is used within other narratives, like uh, the the famous uh, Hawk and Nightingale and Hesiod, yes. for example. Yes, you can do that. Now that there, of course, you get more sort of culturally specific right. takes. As soon because as the fable, context, yes, yeah. as soon as fables are contextualized. Yeah. Um, uh, you, you you get into very interesting questions, uh, as with Mesomedes and yep. his elephant at yep. the ear. Uh, yep. You get into very interesting questions of how people in in specific cultural contexts use this material. Yeah. Um, and that you can again you can also see in non-Greek literatures, um, where um, uh, entire epic poems, for example, can be developed out of fable materials, uh, but then take a very you know culture specific turn. Johannes, this has been really, really very fast. And, and I should say this is the Monday morning of the conference yeah. and, and I'm feeling a bit hungover. And, <laughs> and Johannes, has, <laughs> it's been so stimulating that suddenly I'm awake again and, and I want to learn more. So many, many thanks. It's, it's, and it's a great pleasure again to see you. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you, Johannes. Thank you.